I'll stop by the McBride Museum of Yukon History here in Whitehorse where they have the actual cabin of Sam McGee who was made famous in the uh, poem by Robert Strange, The Cremation of Sam McGee. This is the cabin of Sam McGee. If you never heard the poem Sam McGee, I'll recite it to you if I can find the words. Now this is the inside of Sam's cabin. That bed back there looks about right for a one short person, but he lived here with his wife for nine years. Of course, they had to keep each other warm somehow. This is the unique piece of transportation. Look at the wheel in the lower left. The rails, if you want to call them that, that it rode on were tree trunks. It was a short line used during the gold rush. And when powered by horses. Land got to be such a premium in Whitehorse during the gold rush, they started building two-story skyscrapers out of logs. Still in Whitehorse at the Beringa Interpretive Center where they've interpreted the animal bones that they have found in the Yukon area. Boy, some of those beaver trappers would love to see this guy. Hate to meet this guy in a dark alley. Nice kitty, nice kitty. All of these animals were found in the Yukon area. Can you imagine trying to hunt this beast? We should get something like that for our association. And I'll take a stop at the Transportation Museum in Whitehorse, Yukon Territory. Where the first thing we see is a giant weather vane. The aircraft itself is the weather vane and it pivots with the wind. A few weeks ago I showed you a huge engine in a railroad museum. We'll take a look at the other end of that spectrum. Now when you take a look at this little guy, you see that the cab where the engineer and fireman stand seem to be the largest part of the whole thing. Can't you just picture this with an Army CB guy on it? making the Alaska Highway. Now you see mileposts all along the highway, but they're almost all wrong. Not because they were mismeasured, but because the highway is being made shorter by the using of shortcuts and more improved routes. A bush plane with skis for landing gear. Note the huge prop. It had a very powerful engine. A stagecoach of the Yukon, a sled pulled by horses. Note the blankets furnished by the transportation company for the passengers to wear to cover. In real life, they would have been buffalo robes, not robes, but blankets. Some have been restored to their former glory, and others are still a wreck. This is an 18-cylinder radio aircraft engine. Nine pistons in front and slightly offset nine pistons to the rear. Another bulldozer with the sled that it could pull. Now there's no explanation given for this piece of equipment, but I'm going to take a guess that it's the axle for a paddle wheel, for a stern wheel ship. 
This would be the um, part that would attach to the to the steam engine, and it has been bent severely. It took a lot of force to bend that, and the axle itself is bent. But there are numerous wood spokes attached to this, and they're put in with heavy-duty bolts. This is designed to carry a lot of weight, or to push a lot of weight, to take a lot of strain. A little bit of trivia information for you. This part of a rail car is called the truck. It usually consists of four wheels. The car itself is not bolted to these wheels or the truck. It just sits there on its own weight. It's held by its own weight. This is why you often see them after a train wreck scattered about. They're not broken off, they just fell off. Now we've all seen those uh, shipping containers on top of ships. And then they put them on the railroad, on a rail car, and then they put them on a truck. Well, that was invented right here in the Yukon by this company. They needed a way of quickly transferring cargo from ships to rail, and they thought up the idea, revolutionized transportation around the world, completely different and much more efficient now. A container can go anywhere in the world and never be opened until it arrives at its destination. Yes, it does move with the breeze. There is some noise though, which tells me there is some friction, so it won't move with just the slightest touch. This area was burned out by a fire in 58 is having a difficult time recovering. They're not sure if it's because of the dry valley that we're in or because of the extremely intense heat of the fire. I got a report of a grizzly up the road. We'll go take a look. It's uh, most likely already gone. Although most of the highway is in pretty good shape, some of it is still pretty primitive. We've been told to slow down to about 10 miles an hour when crossing this bridge. Just kidding. But it is one of the original structures, about 10% of which is still here. Uh, the rest of it's been restored or rebuilt or repaired over the years. As you can see from the structure, this is no fake bridge, no Disneyland bridge. This is how they actually built them back then. This is a baked bannock, which is a baking powder biscuit according to this young man. Does your mother make these? Yes. Your mother does. Very good. It's pretty good. Pretty chewy. Very tough crust on it. It looks kind of oily in the middle. That white area at the top of the mountain, that's a glacier. Not a very big one, but nonetheless, it's still there. We just passed, passed a little hamlet called Destruction Bay. And at this point on, I've been advised the road suffers from the heave. And we'll see if we got one coming up here. People up ahead of me just slowed down. Now the heaves aren't what you think they are. That's where the permafrost underneath the highway has either melted and or refrozen, causing the highway to either dip or to buckle up. Can be quite uh, uh, dangerous and uh, destructive to your equipment. My plan is to keep up with these guys, and when they hit the brakes, I'll know to slow down. And we'll see if it works. I'll try to get a picture of something for you. down to about 50 miles an hour. The speed limit is 65. Uh, they often do much faster than that, of course, and if you're doing 70 or 75 along here, uh, you could easily do some damage. 